So over the course of these lectures um, and these videos, I want to introduce uh, the microcosmic orbit um, and the theory behind it. There's quite a lot of theory. There's a lot of methods as well behind uh, this practice. It's very, very in-depth. Uh, so it's going to take me a little while to instruct the different levels. Um, so initially, I just want to introduce what is the Shao Jiutian, the microcosmic orbit, um, as it's commonly known. Yeah, and what place does it have it in Qigong practice? It's one of those um, parts of uh, Qigong that I feel is often uh, quite misunderstood, um, partially with regards to its functions, partially with regards to um, how important it is, also sometimes how difficult it is um, and to understand the actual mechanisms behind its functioning. Um, and that's a real shame because it's one of the most important parts of uh, Qigong training. Yeah. So first of all, uh, Xiao De Tian essentially means a smaller or lesser small orbits of heaven. This is what it refers to. So people obviously call it the, the microcosmic because lesser heaven, the small heaven, the Xiao Tian, is the heaven that's on the inside of your body. So one of the key rules uh, for, for Taoism, or any Taoist practice, was that which happens on the outside of the body is reflected on the inside of the body and, and vice versa. So what they're referring to, the orbit that's established, is a circulation of something that takes place within the body. It's not quite so simple as to just say it's a line of qi that circulates through two channels, which is what most people understand it as. It's more complex than this. To understand the basis of the microcosmic orbit, we need to first understand uh, some of the reasons why people practice it. Yeah? Now, philosophically, the first reason um, is because that people essentially are an integral part of the environment. And this is one of the first um, rationale behind the use of the, of the microcosmic orbit or, or the development of this principle in practice. So basically, um, because there are various rotations that take place within the larger heaven, the environment, okay, within the planets and within the stars and, and so on and so on, these various sort of seasonal cycles and daily cycles and things like this, there must be the same rotations taking place on the inside of the body. Okay? These rotations, these cycles, these changes must be taking place inside of us. This becomes the basis for much of Chinese medicine um, and how they work and how they understand the development of disease, the development of life and, and things like this. But also it's to do with the circulations uh, and the transformations of qi, of energy within the body, um, also of jing, of essence especially. Yeah. So to the Taoists, if somebody was to take their body to the peak of its potential, you know, so it could function at its highest level internally, um, it would have to match the nature of the environment on the outside. So these circulations would need to be established. The view was that the, when you were a child, when you were very, very young, providing you were healthy, um, then you already had these rotations, these cycles on the inside, but they kind of get lost um, as you age and, and mind kicks in. Um, so we want to return these circulations. With regards to the actual orbits that take place in the larger heaven, with regards to what we're looking at, it's largely the sun and the moon um, that they, they are actually trying to sync your circulations with, with regards to the Xiao Jiu Tian, yeah? with the microcosmic orbit. So the lunar cycle takes place over 28 and a half days, whatever, it's, it's the monthly cycle, okay? So the lunar cycle is, takes place over a month. So there is a circulation that takes place within the body over a month that matches the cycles of the moon. There is also a cycle of the sun, which is obviously a daily thing, is a 24-hour cycle um, that is established within the body as well. And the idea was to the Taoists that the sun and the moon were the greatest representations of yin and yang, uh, ultimately in our environment that we could contact uh, through our practice, or, or yin and yang that influence us over the course of our lives, of our daily lives, you know. So they were trying to harmonize and sync the qi and the jing uh, within the body uh, with these cycles that took place. So it's not just that the microcosmic orbit is a movement of qi that takes place with your breath or circulates um, very quickly within the body. Uh, it, it actually has a few different timings depending on what aspect of the microcosmic orbit you're looking at. So the second uh, reason was that this was the basis for yang sheng fa, yang sheng fa. Okay, 
So Yang Sheng Fa essentially means uh, life nourishing techniques, if we look at it literally. Um, but we could call this, if we translate that to English, I call this uh, healthy living. And you will get two different types of Yang Shen Fa talked about uh, within Chinese teachings. The first of these, uh, these healthy living principles, what we might just call Yang Shen Fa, are to do with um, you know, correct sleep patterns and uh, correct levels of exercise and eating the right food and, and learning how to balance your rest and activities, all of the things you would associate with sensible, healthy living. That's the first aspect of Yang Shen Fa. But then there is another aspect to Yang Shen Fa, which is sometimes called Yang Shen Dao. So instead of this being healthy living principles like Yang Shen Fa, this would be essentially the mastery of uh, healthy living or the way of healthy living. Basically, if something is a Tao, it is a uh, process or a path, pathless path ultimately, that can be followed as a form of cultivation. So it's, it implies that it's something much higher than this. So somebody who would mastering um, Yang Sheng Fa would mean they knew how to work healthily with their body using, like I say, their food and their sleep and their rest and blah, blah, blah. Somebody who understood Yang Sheng Dao understood how to take the body's functioning to an extremely high level um, so that it, it essentially functioned very, very efficiently. And ultimately, the idea was that if somebody was functioning very, very efficiently with regards to their body, they would be very, very healthy. So the basis of this would be, um, you know, regulation of, uh, you know, the health of the organs, the Zangfu organs on the inside of the body, they would function to a high level. The mind would be stabilized and functioning to a high level. But on top of this, a lot of the things like longevity um, that you hear about being you know, the hallmark of Taoist practice certainly, isn't it? You know, it's not that it was their aim, but as a byproduct of what they did, people would extend their youthful vigor for a very, very long time. This was from Yang Sheng Dao. Um, and on top of that, the ability to generate a lot of energy or a lot of spirit. Now, sometimes people don't understand why you want so much qi or why you want so much uh, connection to Shen. Why, why do you want these things? Um, but it was because to the Taoists, to our chemical practitioners, these substances, these fuels, these forms of energy were required in order to take uh, consciousness to a higher level. So it was the basis um, of their enlightenment uh, process. Now, the third reason that we established uh, Sha Du Tian uh, is essentially for safety. And this is a, a big one. Um, is because Taoism is a tradition always uh, took the stance that everything that you did with your mind was reflected in the body and vice versa. So what that meant, it's almost like the, the body was another microcosm of the mind rather than just being of the environment. So that if you were to try to cultivate um, enlightenment or immortality, it would involve work with the body. Essentially, you would have to convert these things within the body to transform the mind. This was different from some other traditions that were very, very much based purely in consciousness, but Taoism did not separate the two. To the Taoists, it was almost nonsensical to attempt to achieve some kind of liberation while your body was dropping to bits. Okay? They felt the two should be worked on at the same time. Now, in order to uh, work at this level, there's a huge amount of energy that has to move through the energetic system, through the channel system. And as we go through the training of the microcosmic orbit, I'll explain to you more about what this actually means because it's not quite as fluffy as you might think from, from that phrase, moving energy within the channels. Now, one of the byproducts of moving energy through the channels is that it starts to put a lot more pressure into the body. The body heats up um, and a lot more energy rises and things like this. The nervous system can become stressed uh, through this kind of training. And over a long term, this can be a little bit damaging. At first, it's drying for the body. Um, and then it's a little bit overheating and, and overstimulating. So essentially, the microcosmic orbit was put in place to make sure that there was a circuit, almost like an earthing wire on the body, so that when its energy was raised up, that it could also be dropped back down once again. Because people who engage in very, very strong um, yang-based energy practices that don't have the microcosmic orbit in place do run the risk of just burning themselves out because there's nothing to return everything back to the base of the body. So this was another very important for it, reason for it, yeah. Fourth one was to open the channel system. So the microcosmic orbit uh, assists with the opening of the rest of the channels. 
So the channels, we're talking about things that exist on different levels within the body. So the first one of these would be the sinew channels, the jing jin uh, within Chinese thought, which essentially are all the lines of connective tissue and elasticated um, fascia and everything like this that runs through the length of the body. Now there is a way to activate and open this channel system and ultimately that means to deliver more yang qi via the microcosmic orbit into the sinew channels until they animate. So a lot of the animation and movement and mobilization of the inside of the body, the building of the inner environment so that it has life in it, um, relies on an open channel system that comes from the microcosmic orbit. So that's very, very important. Maybe if I write those down actually, because they're quite vi vital. It's like 4A, yeah? 4A is the sinew channels, okay? They need to open first. 4B, okay? We actually have the channels that exist in the energy body. So now we are talking about something a little bit more esoteric. Within um, Western thought, we might talk about the body and then we talk about the mind. And then maybe within some traditions, we might talk about sort of bioelectricity or biomagnetism within the body or something like this as well. But in Chinese thought, um, as well as Indian as well, actually, um, Eastern traditions, essentially, they don't talk about one body with things in it. They talk about multiple bodies. So you have a physical body, you have an energy body. Yeah? You would then have a, uh, the mental body, you would have the spiritual body, the karmic body, the causal body. These are all bodies as far as they're concerned. Because the definition of a body for the Eastern traditions was ultimately something that you resided within or something you experienced yourself through. So in the same way that we might say that a body, our physical body is a, is a vehicle for us, if you like, to mobilize around, we would also, to the Eastern traditions, they would also say that the mental body and the causal body and the energy body were also further vehicles for the expression of consciousness. So they were, they were talking about them in a very specific fashion. The energy body is made up of all of the channel system. You have main key channels, but then you have all little subsidiary branches as well that are incalculable. Some traditions have tried to put a number on, a number on it. You'll see any number from 108 through to 72,000 branches of the energy channels. Within Taoism, generally, they talk about 10,000 smaller branches. And 10,000 ultimately is a metaphorical number, meaning there's a lot of them. Yeah. So if you were to see the energy body, it would look a little bit like all the little um, capillaries and everything. Have you ever looked at a, a, an image or a photo or a diagram of the a circulatory system and you see all the little tiny capillaries running through the body? It's like a big mass of tangled sort of fibers and, and pathways. The energy body is the same. Yeah, it's, it's very, very complicated. But the energy body needs to have um, space within it and it needs mobilization of chi within those little pathways. It could, the mobilization of chi can happen in different ways. It can happen via the breath, happen via the action of the dantian, it can happen via your movements. But one of the key ways is via the microcosmic orbit. As these two channels open up, they say that the du channel, the channel on your back, governs the actions of yang within those smaller channels. And the ren channel, the channel on the front of your body, governs the yin actions of those body. And again, I'll break those down and talk about what those actually mean um, at a later stage. With regards to that with the energy body, already getting a little intricate, you also have a, um, a, a polarity switch that takes place within the body, hour to hour. So in some traditions, they talk about it being 50 minutes apart. It's very, very exact. Some traditions, they talk about it being an hour apart. And Taoism talks about an hour. Every t it switches every hour. So the idea is that on the hour, your body's polarity switches from yin to yang. And that's what starts to happen. And within the body, this is matched by the uh, left and right side branches of the Chong Mai, of the central channel. So the idea is that one of your side branches is yang, that's the one on the, my left, and one of your side branches is yin, this is the one on my right, the opposite of what my, most people might think. And what happens is one of those channels is always dominant within the energy system. So during one hour of the day, you will be yang dominant, during the next hour of the day, you will be yin dominant. And this is supposed to healthily happen so that somebody moves from, fluctuates from yin to yang over the course of the day, hour by hour by hour. Essentially what happens is if you think of a central point and then you've got these two branches that are either side of the central point and they're switching polarity. So this one's dominant, that one's dominant, this one's dominant, this, that one's dominant. It starts to actually move to create like a spiral through the inside of the body. And this is what controls the central channel. 
this spiral is very, very important within deeper esoteric arts, esoteric aspects of the sort of alchemical arts. Now, for most people, what actually happens is one or more of those channels are slightly dominant. So that switch is not taking place quite so healthily as it should. So some people are more yang dominant, some people are more yin dominant. And you can find these characteristics yourself. So someone who is yang tends to be a little bit more outgoing, maybe a little bit more frustrated in their nature if you look at the negative things, tend to overheat, be a little bit hot. Somebody who is yin dominant might be a little bit more reclusive, um, a little bit tendency towards cold, um, and these kind of qualities, you know. And essentially, part of the reason this is happening because they are fluctuating but staying for longer than that healthy switch on one side of, of yin or yang. They're getting stuck in one of those polarities. When the Du and the Ren channel open and the microcosmic orbit circulates properly, the idea is that within the energy body, that that yin and yang polarity switch is harmonized so it happens equally steadily as it's supposed to so it brings someone more towards a central point within the body so it calms yin or yang within the energy system and that's not something you often hear sp spoken about very much because i think that sometimes uh, people tend to stay away from that that kind of sort of esoteric aspect of the energy system but it's definitely a part of the microcosmic orbit teachings now uh the fifth reason okay so as well as so we've got sort of um Link into the environment, mastering the efficiency of the body, opening the channel system um, and safety and, and so on and so on. Also for meditation. And sometimes people don't know that uh, the microcosmic orbit is involved in this. So uh, within meditation practices, different traditions will use different objects. So what I mean by that is... For many meditation systems, there's normally an observer, an aspect of your consciousness, and then there is an object, something that is being used as the object of meditation. So often that object is the breath. Sometimes that object is the body. Sometimes that object might be a mantra, might be a, a mental quality like loving kindness or something like this. These are the objects that someone will meditate upon. And ultimately what happens is when the observer and the object relate to each other in a very specific way, then meditation opens up, the state opens up. And sometimes this is called absorption um, or something like this. Now, one of the key objects within alchemical meditation is the movement of chi within the microcosmic orbit. So what I mean by this is once they've established a flow that rotates in a particular pattern within the body, there is a conversion taking place then there's actually um, a mental process of absorbing into that rotation so that that becomes the object of meditation. The idea is that then the uh, states of jhana or chan in Chinese are entered into um, via the microcosmic orbit, meaning that your, the actions, the energetics of your body has become the object of meditation. So it's, it's a very, very um, high level aspect to the microcosmic orbit, a very, very high end of the practice. Sixth reason, actually, put this in as well. To do with a golden embryo. Sounds very high-minded, and it is <laughs> high-minded. So the golden embryo was a, a practice within um, uh, alchemy, where essentially what would happen is an aspect of the spirit would be uh, fed with enough stillness, fed with enough of your mental awareness absorbed into this spirit, so that it started to animate essentially of its own accord. So the idea is the spirit could exist independently of the body. And this was a, um, an esoteric alchemical practice that some people don't believe in anymore, but it was the way for uh, harnessing and producing like a carrier for the spirit so that it could elevate out of the body um, at the point of death and escape the cycle of rebirth. This was one method uh, that was used. It's a method that appears within Taoism and also within some um, more esoteric Hindu sects um, as well. And part of the function of the microcosmic orbit, if you really want to look back at the original aims of it, uh, was to actually feed and nurture the golden embryo. So if somebody was trying to build uh, this highest end of the alchemical training within their body, they would require the circulation of Jing Qi Shen that took place within the Du and Ren channel in order to nourish and feed this substance, this spirit within the center of the body, almost like the incubation system you're plugging it into, if you like, if you want to. Get in a really unartistic fashion. Now, for uh, people who aren't of that belief system, um, I would say that's okay, it's fine. Like some people want to look at things in a scientific um, modality or a scientific way of looking at things. Uh, some people not so much, you know, people come from different camps. Some people are very much about uh, the sort of 
I guess, kind of belief or, or faith side of approach to the arts. And some people want to know what's actually happening inside the body with regards to nerves and the endocrine system and so on and so on. Actually, the microcosmic orbit is very interesting as a practice because it touches on both those camps. Um, so very much for like the basis for Yang Shen Dao, the health-based aspects of the practice, the safety, and even the start of the opening of the channel system with regards to the sinew system, it's actually very, very scientific. It's possible to explain all of those process, processes um, through actual movement of substances within the center of the body. We can talk about it with regards to the nerves. We can talk about it with regards to the glandular system. Um, and you can understand, actually. So I'm never against people who want to take that stance on it. I think it's okay. There is something physiological that happens in the body through these arts. Um, and I'll explain what those things are. I want to talk about it with regards to the nervous system, especially so you can understand it. But then the other reason this practice is interesting is because it touches on the other camp as well. Because things like the deeper aspects of the energy body, where I'm talking about the switch from yin to yang within these two side branches, or these little subsidiary um, branches of energetic movement through the inside of the body, or meditation, absorption of, into the object might sound confusing or, or unusual to some people, or the golden embryo can definitely uh, sit quite far at the esoteric end of things. Um, but the microcosmic orbit is also used to nourish and develop that side of the training as well. So if you're the kind of person who, you know, that is not within your belief system, what I would say is that's fine, no problem at all. Um, but maybe sometimes uh, look at it and listen to it and try to understand it because it was a belief system of the people that founded the practice, even if you only wish to touch upon the aspects that you can understand physiologically, that's okay. So the microcosmic orbit does all of these things, or this is the basis of it. And if we wanted to break it down into its absolute simplest, simplest stages, more lists, I apologize. I'm going to put a new list down here. <laughs> I like to list things because it makes it very clear. The first one is there must be the circulation of Yang Qi, circulation of Yang Qi. This is the first stage of it. And it moves through the Du and the Ren channels. And this is the aspect of the microcosmic orbit that most people who've studied some Qigong before will be familiar with. So ultimately what it means um, is that a form of energy, the Yang Qi, which actually is a form of bioelectricity, must circulate up through the center line of the back, and then it comes into the head actually, and then down the front center line of the body. There are other directions, other circulations, but that is the key one, the first one, yeah? So that the Yang Qi moves uh, over the back and down the front on your, on your center line. This is the first aspects of the microcosmic orbit. And it's not actually that difficult to achieve providing you know um, what you're doing and you know the methodology, yeah? The second aspect uh, that I really want to uh, focus on and, and touch upon is the conversion of Jing within the body, conversion of Jing. Now your Jing, as I'm sure many of you listening to this are aware, is your essence, okay? Um, it is that fuel within the oil lamp that we don't want to burn out too quickly, but it's always moving, it's always mobilizing. The Jing is always moving into action because of our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, our, our you know, our cellular reproduction and our physical, you know, all these things, processes taking place on the inside of the body, this activates and, and uses up the Jing as well. So the Jing is always converting. It's always turning into something else. The essence is producing the potential for all of these functional activities of the body. But the microcosmic orbit allows us to contact and govern and regulate uh, that transformation of Jing so that it works for us in our favor. It's like it refines and makes that process far, far more efficient so that it takes place in a much healthier fashion. There's even at higher levels, some people don't believe in this uh, within Qigong, but it's definitely true, there are a way to there's a way to replenish the Jing through the microcosmic orbit if you know how to do it. And it's not just a case of circulating up the back and down the front, it, it's more complex than that. Uh, but I will show you how that happens. I'll explain to you how that takes place. So after this, there are other stages including uh, the circulation of congenital fluid within the body. So once the Jing has been refined and converted uh, into a particular substance, um, there is a way that that substance then has to move through the body 
And what it does is it starts to nourish the body. So they talk about that being um, a spiritual form of medicine, the Xian Yao. And what happens is that medicine, the immortal medicine, um, that's produced uh, from your practice, moves through the Du channel, moves through the Ren channel, where it passes into the rest of the channel system. Ultimately, what that means is that substance interacts with the nervous system um, and starts to transform the body in a very specific fashion. And it kind of resets many of the health processes within your body or many of the poor health processes within the body, if you like. Um, so it is a huge tonification. And it is the aspect of the training that starts to move you towards Yang Sheng Dao, to this sort of mastery of the body's efficiency of functioning. If you look at many of the stories of high-level sages, the things they could do, or their ages they reached, or that kind of ageless look where you couldn't tell how old someone was, the idea was that they had mastered the congenital fluid um, level of the microcosmic orbit training. An interesting one. It's one of the later stages, and I'll break these down in more detail for you. This is just to introduce this to you at the moment, is light. So at the later stage, the light is actually circulated through the channels. And interestingly enough, in some um, esoteric Buddhist traditions from China that I've encountered, it's almost like they ignore the other stages before that and they just focus upon the light. Whereas in Taoism, there's a progression towards that part of the training. So part of the reason that they would focus upon the light within esoteric Chinese Buddhism um, is because the light essentially is the substance, if you like, of consciousness um, to them. That is the, the root of what everything is made up with upon the mental level. So when they are circulating consciousness within the body or they're experiencing how consciousness interacts with the body, um, then this takes place within the microcosmic orbit. They have a different name for it, actually. They call it the, wi uh, the winding wheel of law sometimes, or the falun, the wheel of, wheel of law, something like this. Um, but essentially, it's an aspect of the microcosmic orbit. The last one I'll put here, because we tend to do things in fives, if as much as we can, avoid the number four, um, is the circulation of Dan. That's not a person. That's the elixir. So the Dan, the same Dan as Dantian, the alchemical pill that is formulated um, in high-level Nedan, again, it's the same Dan, this elixir, um, is actually moved through the microcosmic orbit, and this is how the pill is swallowed, if you like. So pill is obviously metaphorical. It, it's actually something that takes place within the center of your consciousness, um, but it looks a little bit like a pill, and this is moved through those channels, um, and they talk about this being swallowing the pill. But I'm not going to touch upon that too much, because that's... That's like the far, far end of Taoism, but I just want to show you that that's a part of the training, part of it. The majority of the work we wish to focus on, really, I think for most people, is stage one, circulation of Yang Qi and the two, two and the Ren, and stage two, the conversion of Jing within the body, which is much like the water cycle, and we need to understand that a little bit. And with regards to um, which of the rationale for the microcosmic orbit I'm going to focus upon in this training, it's actually going to be stage one to stage four. So I'm primarily going to look at the understanding of the microcosmic orbit in relation to the environment, um, how it becomes a basis for your health, uh, for, for regulating Yang Xin Fa within the body and Yang Xin Dao. Safety, I'll look at as well, because I don't think it's ever wise to introduce what is essentially quite a complex internal mechanism without talking about safety. Um, and then I'm also going to look at the opening of the channel system, what that means, why you want to do it, how you know when it's happened, um, and, and how we do this with the microcosmic orbit. Right at the end of the training, I'll touch upon these other two, the meditation and the golden embryo, but just from a theoretical standpoint, just to give you a little bit of background knowledge. So this is the basis for the microcosmic orbit. This is the main reason that we practice it, and this is essentially what it, what it is. But now we need to look at a couple of rules for the, um, for the microcosmic orbit. A couple of rules that were highlighted within classical texts um, but somehow seem to have been ignored within modern teachings a little bit, and I don't really understand how that has happened, why that sort of, um, why that disparity between what the ancient teachers said and what modern teachers are doing quite often. So I'll put these here, and I'll sit back so I'm not on the way of the board. And essentially, the first rule is you must be prepared, and I don't mean mentally or emotionally, like it's going to be some really exciting process. I mean, you must be bodily prepared. There must be foundation work put in place. So the idea was that the microcosmic orbit would require a certain foundation level of skill with regards to your breath, a certain level of skill with regards to your mind, 
and a certain level of skill with regards to the functioning of chi around the lower abdomen and the dantian. And when I start looking at the practices for the microcosmic orbit, I will show you how to understand if you are prepared, if the foundations are in place. If the foundations are not in place and the microcosmic orbit is engaged with, then one of two things will happen. One, option one, it won't work. Option two, you can actually damage yourself because essentially what you're going to do is you're going to send more energy into the spinal nerves in the early stages. Now, if you think about the spinal nerves and what they do, I mean, you're going to send things up through your nervous system, past the kidneys, you're going to stimulate the adrenals and you're going to put yourself into fight or flight, which at first is no big deal. You might feel a little bit sort of jittery, but over a longer term of practice, you're looking at creating chronic anxiety attacks and mood swings and things like this. Sometimes people have accidentally thought they've had like a Kundalini awakening or something, which is really not the case. All they've done is they've hyper-stimulated the nervous system um, through these kind of practices. So in order to avoid that, because nobody wants to do that, um, is I will explain to you the preparation that is involved to make sure that you are prepared enough to practice it. The second part of it is you use no imagination. The imagination is not used in microcosmic orbit practice. You do not um, visualize anything moving around the body. You do not imagine something moving around the body either. This is not the case. You also don't guide the chi around the body. So there's many people that are moving their mind around the do and a ren and doing the ren. So they're, what they're actually doing is they're bringing their mind into the spine, bring up the back, over the head and down the front. We don't do that. You also don't activate the microcosmic orbit by focusing on a series of acupuncture points in sequence. So some people will focus on the sacrum and then on Ming Men in the middle of the back and maybe the jade pillow on the back of the occiput and then the top of the head and so on and so on to guide the chi around. That is not correct. We don't wish to um, do that. That's like pulling the chi, like trying to guide it with the mind. That's not what we do. We actually do the opposite. It gets pushed from behind from pressurization of the lower dantian and the sinking of qi and consolidation of something called the furnace around the base of the body. So I'll explain to you um, how we do that. Within certain classics, including um, one version of the Secret of the Golden Flower, which is a you know, highly widespread classical text within China, but what some people don't realize is there's several different versions of it written in different ways, um, kind of different teachers take on it. And one of the versions of it was very, very clear on the microcosmic orbit. And some of the clearest teachings on the microcosmic orbit are from that text. And they are very, very um, specific within there that we do not guide, we do not lead, we do not imagine the microcosmic orbit circulating within the body. So that's not something we do. The same problem has arisen within the microcosmic orbit as within many Qigong practices. Is that what people have done have read, read a book that say what you will experience. And they might say, you will experience Qi moving to the crown or something like this. So then what they think that means is you must lead the chi to the crown, but it's not the case. Yeah, you will experience chi leading to the crown is not the same. The teachings are confirmatory, not instructional. And I think sometimes people have made that mistake. So we do not use the imagination or the visualization. The counter to that is if I move my mind up my back and down my front, I will feel a tingling experience of something moving. That's true, you will feel that. Um, but that's your mind interacting with the nervous system. As soon as you walk away and do something else, make a cup of tea, get on with your life, that will stop. It will end because that's not the mechanism that we use to establish it. Yeah. Third one, third rule for the uh, microcosmic orbit is we don't force anything. So kind of going back to that idea of not leading it, but there is, um, there's a mechanism we use to consolidate the chi around the base of the body so that it wishes to move into the do channel. And we must understand that we do not use too much force while we're doing it. The body is more delicate than you might think um, with regards to the channel system. So, and it, that's not helped by the fact that sometimes you don't have a lot of um, sensitivity to the inside. I mean, you might think you do, you're like, I can feel all the chi or something. Some people might be like this, but how is that compared to the outside of the body? You know, if I if I tap this pen on my hand, I feel that really clearly, or I tap it on my face, I can feel it. I can feel the, I can actually feel the sort of air pressure change in the room a little bit. The temperature is different in different areas. Like I, there's all these sensations coming from my nervous system from the outside of the body. I don't have that same level of feedback to the inside, or many people don't have the same level of feedback to the inside. Even if they feel something, it's not quite as strong. It's not quite as clear because you're not used to using your peripheral nervous system. Uh, you're used to using, you, sorry, you're used to using your peripheral nervous system to feel things outside. 
inside is a little bit more tricky. So what happens is then when people start to engage with some internal processes, because they can't feel it quite so strongly, they'll use a lot of force. And only when they use a lot of force do they start to feel it. But what they don't realize is what you're feeling is the tip of the iceberg to the effects that are taking place on the inside. So, okay, you're feeling it now. What that means is enough energy is moving through your body for you to experience that movement. And quite often that's a lot of energy because energy is moving around you all the time inside your body all day and many people never feel it. So think how much extra force are you doing to take that process and make it so it's very, very tangible on the inside. It can be quite a lot. And the result of this is you can actually put the body into a state of stress or the mind into a state of stress. So we don't use force. The rules for almost all Qigong, in my opinion, with regards to internal mechanisms, is we always train um, the causes. So we want to understand what is the cause that is created by the exercise or what is the cause that is created by the um, principle we're studying, right? We put the causes in place, and that's a lot of what your tools are for. So if you have a Qigong exercise, whatever it is, normally that's a cause. What happens is the cause, the exercise, creates an effect, but the effect is created as a byproduct of the cause. So what I don't do to make that effect a lot stronger is force it with my mind or force it through, through physical tension or anything, nothing like this. I simply focus on the causes and then listen and the effects will arise. And the microcosmic orbit um, is uh, an important example of this. Fourth one, there is no, I'll put MCO as a shorthand, just so I don't have to keep writing it, but there's no microcosmic orbit exercise. <laughs> So some of you might be familiar with some of my teachings on the Yijin Jing, the sinew changing classic. Um, if you're not, don't worry, but some of you are. One of the things I always tell people is the sinew changing classic or sinew changing Yijin Jing is not a set of exercises. It is a principle that arises within all Qigong practice. So the exercises are just exercises that are named after it. The microcosmic orbit is the same. There is no exercise called the microcosmic orbit. I don't do this exercise, this movement and it arises. It's not how it works. The microcosmic orbit is an orbit that takes place in the microcosm of your body. The name kind of tells you. It is the circulation of Yang Qi, the conversion of Jing, and so on and so on, that naturally unfold as a byproduct of your internal development. So what that means is the microcosmic orbit is actually to be expected to arise within most authentic Neigong or Qigong systems. It might arise at different times, it might arrive in different qualities, but it is something that should happen when your body reaches a certain level of efficiency. When the qi hits the dantian to a high enough degree, when there's enough pressurization of certain centers within the body, when you've conditioned the spinal nerves and the du channel in the right way, then the microcosmic orbit will start to arise. So rather than teaching you a microcosmic orbit exercise in this program, that doesn't exist, I will get you to understand the causes, the principles that, are caught, that establish the arising of the microcosmic orbit, and then I'll show you how to build those into your body. I'll show you how to establish the causes. Okay, fifth one. Fifth one. With regards to the microcosmic orbit, um, another one of the greatest misunderstandings for me is it doesn't use your sexual energy. And this phrase comes up over and over again. Now, you might think I'm splitting hairs, but this one actually is a bit of a bugbear of mine because it does use the jing, it does use the essence. Um, and you could say that your jing, or your, I've already told you that conversion jing, right? You could say that your jing or your essence is the basis of your sexuality. Um, that's partially true, actually. Um, there are various other parts of your body that are involved in your sexuality. Uh, various, the kidney yang has a large part to play with it. Uh, the ministerial and emperor fires have a large part to play with it, the action of the heart. The jing is only one part of this whole process. The jing also carries out all sorts of other functions aside from your sexuality. It's not just to do with the production of sexual fluids. As I kind of mentioned earlier already, reproduction of cells, production of blood in the body, body fluids, growth, like anything. Like, you know, your body replaces itself every seven years, right? that sort of physical replacing of the body takes place because of the jing. So it's not just to do with sexual energy. So as soon as people start focusing in on this one very, very specific function of the jing, saying that it's sexual energy, it already starts to set up the wrong intent because how you view things will change the intent behind the practice. 
And when I've seen people try to um, talk about the microcosmic orbit in this way, it actually starts to create a few problems. And when I start to look at the actions and movement of Jing, um, we'll, we'll explore why. What are these problems that arise? And actually, they're psychiatric problems quite often, um, sometimes physiological things. Um, but generally psychiatric things. So you won't hear me talk about, apart from in the negative to say it's wrong, you won't hear me talk about sexual energy, particularly with regards to the microcosmic orbit. I will purely talk about essence, but I will explain each of these terms to you um, in detail. So this is the microcosmic orbit, um, or this is the rationale behind it. And this is what I want to try and teach. So what I will do is through a series of theoretical lectures, I will explain to you all of the mechanisms as far as I understand are behind the microcosmic orbit so you can see what it's for. I want to demystify it to a certain extent um, so that it's very, very clear for you, especially the physiological sides of it, so you can know what's happening inside the body. I also want to explain very clear signs of progress, how you know it's happening, and also pitfalls and dangers associated with it as well. What I'll then do is make very clear what are the causes that enabled it to arise, and I'll show you some exercises based mainly on breathing, actually, um, and uh, Negong exercises that actually take your body to the state that when it is ready, um, it will begin the microcosmic orbit circulation. This is quite important for me personally to do, because I think um, when you look at Qigong or when you look at Negong, you look at the internal arts, there are various uh, processes and practices um, that are mentioned over and over, and they're kind of fundamental and foundational. Everyone's heard the phrases before. So previously, one for me was the sinew change in the Yijin Jing, um, and I wanted to make sure people understood what that was. The next one I want to look at now is the microcosmic orbit, because I think it's a term lots of people have heard, so, and, I, and I really want people to understand, because I feel there's quite a lot of misinformation um, around this aspect of Negong training or Qigong training. <laughs> 